friend told you about me, I, I thought I might just add that uh, my undergraduate degree was in Russian studies from the University of Michigan, which is not too far from here, and we're big rivals with Ohio State. <laughs> so I thought I would throw that in, because it was, in fact, at Michigan where I first became interested in all things Russian. And actually, after my junior year, I was able in 1967 to go with a group of students and professors and visit the Soviet Union, which was uh, a very exciting experience. And I've never, I've never lost my fascination with, with Russia, the former Soviet Union in Russia since then. <clears throat> So today, I'm going to talk about um, the, the topic of my latest book, um, Orders to Kill. And uh, here is Mr. Putin. How did Vladimir Putin emerge to become so powerful that he could do away with his critics at will? More important, perhaps, is is a leader really powerful when he has to kill his opponents in order to keep his job? I'm, this is a quote from a, a friend of mine who's a journalist, uh, and he wrote about Mr. Putin. Under normal circumstances, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin might today be a track-suited personal security guard for one of, of the many oligarchs who in fact live and breathe and luxuriate at his pleasure. Short, bald, with an almost reptilian gait, the former KGB officer never seemed destined for anything other than a bit player in the never-ending Russian tragedy. Well, Putin actually joined the KGB in Leningrad in 1975. He became a rank-and-file officer and was eventually posted to East Germany. After 1991, he left the KGB because the KGB actually was disbanded, and he began working in the St. Petersburg mayor's office. He enriched himself and, and his friends through lucrative government contracts. He was actually in charge of licensing foreign exports. In 1996, Putin moved to the Kremlin after the, um, his mentor, Anatoly Sobchak, lost the race for uh, mayor in 1996. Putin was responsible at the Kremlin for Kremlin property abroad, which also gave him um, an opportunity to um, enrich himself and, and others. In 1998, he was appointed uh, chief of the FSB, the Federal Security Service, which was a successor agency to the KGB. And all of a sudden, in August 1999, he became prime minister and the chosen heir to Yeltsin. Yeltsin, by this time, was in ill health. He was uh, an alcoholic. He was very unpopular. And everyone, including Yeltsin himself, knew that he could not stay in the presidency. So they had to decide upon who would take over for Yeltsin. And he and his close circle of friends, which they called the family, decided on Putin. It was really a Faustian bargain. The oligarchs supported his, uh, the oligarchs supported his candidacy for president to, in 2000, mainly because he had all the files on corruption by the people that surrounded Yeltsin and Yeltsin's family himself. So, but he was a, an unknown person, and what really catapulted him um, into the presidency and made him uh, well known enough that he had, could actually win the elections was the bombings, uh, the very well-known tragic bombings of a series of apartment buildings in September 1999 in Russia. Um, it was over 300 people were killed, and it was kind of Russia's version of, of our 9-11. Putin was the newly minted prime minister. He blamed the bombings on Chechen terrorists and decided to unleash the Second Chechen War. And he became extremely popular 
mainly because he vowed that he would seek revenge against the Chechen people. Oops. Um, it took a while before people understood that Putin was the complete antithesis of a Democrat. Even Bill Browder praised him publicly until he was expelled from Russia in 2005. You've probably heard of Bill Browder, who wrote the book Red Notice. Um, Putin rolled back on democratic reforms introduced in the Yeltsin years and began clamping down on the independent media. Significantly, he installed his cronies from St. Petersburg, including from the KGB, the former KGB, into key positions in the Kremlin. These men were called the Siloviki, or strong men, because they were either from the police or the, or the security agencies, or, or the military. Uh, these Putin allies controlled the security services and the criminal investigation agencies, as they still do today. This meant that when key Putin critics and political opponents um, were murdered, Putin's men would control the investigations. There were, I'm just going to discuss today some of the more prominent cases of political murders that occurred under Putin and that Putin, I think, was, was directly implicated in. Um, the first, Anna award-winning journalist Anna Politkovskaya was gunned down in the stairwell of her Moscow apartment building in October 2006. Next, former FSB officer Alexander Litvinenko was poisoned by polonium in the, in the UK a month later. Democratic politician Boris Nemtsov was shot to death on a bridge just outside Kremlin walls in February 2015. And then, most recently, is the case you've all been hearing about, former GRU, uh, military intelligence, that is, GRU uh, agent or officer, Sergei Skripal, was poisoned along with his daughter, Yulia, in March of this year. Uh, these victims had several things in common. <clears throat> they had all made themselves personal enemies of Vladimir Putin. Politkovskaya was a reporter for Novaya Gazeta. She traveled more than 50 times to Chechnya, documenting the war there and the atrocities committed by the Russian military during the Second Chechen War, which was launched when Putin was prime minister. She wrote in scathing terms about the Chechen leader, Ramzan Kadyrov, and Putin himself. I'm going to give you one quote so you get an idea of the kind of uh, things that uh, Politkovskaya said. Why do I dislike Putin? This is precisely why. I dislike him for a matter of factness worse than thievery, for his cynicism, for his racism, for his lies, for the massacre of innocence that went on throughout his first term. It was Politkovskaya who coined the phrase the Kremlin's Chechen dragon to describe Ramzan Kadyrov the Chechen leader, with whom she had a terrifying encounter in the summer of 2004. Uh, Alexandra Litvinenko, um, in the, who is, I've mentioned earlier, in November 1998, while he was still an FSB officer, Litvinenko gave a scandalous television press conference um, announcing that the FSB had asked him and his colleagues to kill Russian oligarch Boris Berezovsky. This was uh, not something that m most uh, uh, FSB officers would ever do, and it landed uh, Litvinenko in deep trouble. Afterwards, he actually met with Mr. Putin, who is at the time uh, FSB chief, face to face. The meeting did not go well. Litvinenko was imprisoned and later fled Russia for the United Kingdom. That was in 2000. He became a fierce and relentless critic of the Kremlin. 
uh, financed, by the way, mainly by Boris Berezovsky, the oligarch that I mentioned, who himself became uh, a, a, an enemy of Mr. Putin and, and sought asylum in the UK. Um, Litvinenko wrote a book about the 1999 bombings, accusing the FSB of orchestrating the bombings. This was not uh, a very popular thing to do. He also did contract work for businesses in, in the UK that were dealing with Russia. And as part of his work, he reported on the Russian mafia abroad and Putin's connections to the mafia. But what probably sealed Litvinenko's fate more than anything else, <coughs> or may have, I should say, was in the summer of 2006, when he wrote an article accusing Putin of being a pedophile. Um, Alex Goldfarb, who was a, a close colleague of Litvinenko, uh, whom I know well, observed this. I would think that if you say Mr. Putin is a pedophile, it would make Mr. Putin mad regardless of the fact whether he's a pedophile or not. Now, this is Boris Nimsov, who also became an enemy of Mr. Putin. Boris Nimsov was uh, not only a leading member of the democratic opposition movement, he had formerly worked in Yeltsin's government as a, as a deputy minister. Uh, Nimsov organized the 2011-2012 protest movements against the Kremlin. I don't know if you'll recall those. They were widespread street protests. Uh, Nimsov also published a series of reports about Putin documenting the extensive corruption of Putin and his cronies. The first such report was written in 2008, and that was called Putin, the Results, and it was a very, very damning expose. Then uh, Nemtsov wrote a, a report about the corruption that surrounded the Winter Olympics in Sochi. And just before Nimsov was killed in uh, February 2015, he was about to publish another report called Putin the War, and this was about Russia's military aggression in Ukraine. But perhaps more than anything else, what angered Putin was that Nemtsov was a vocal supporter of Western sanctions against Russia. And he traveled to Washington to lobby in favor of such laws as the Magnitsky Act, which I think you've heard of, which imposed sanction, sanctions on uh, Russians for human rights violations. <coughs> this is Sergei Skripal and his daughter, Yulia, right before they were poisoned in March. Putin probably did not uh, meet Sergei Skripal face to, face, to face. Uh, but Skripal, as a former GRU, or military intelligence officer, was indeed, uh, according to Russia, he was a traitor. He even admitted to having given up the names of dozen, dozens of GRU agents to Britain's MI6. And he was tried with treason and sent to prison. In 2010, Skripal was engaged, uh, in, exchanged in a spy swap with Western spies. Among them were those um, Russian spies that were in the United States as sleeper agents, deep undercover. So this was quite a sensational spy swap. And Skripal ended up in, uh, in the UK. <clears throat> now, another thing that these four people um, had in common was that they all knew that they were on the Kremlin's hit list and had received warm warnings. Politkovskaya had received death threats in 2001 and even fled briefly to Vienna. She was poisoned in, two, in September of 2004 as she flew to Beslan in South Ossetia to act as a negotiator with Islamic radicals who were holding hostages at, as a school there. I don't know if you remember that hostage crisis in 2004. It was very tragic. Hundreds of school children and, and teachers were, were killed. Well, she was on her, Poitkoska was on her way 
down there and she drank a cup of tea on the plane and uh, she ended up in hospital very ill and so she never made it. Politkovskaya said actually in a 2006 uh, video, she said, why am I still alive? If I speak seriously about this, I would understand it as a miracle. Both Litvinenko, um, who knew uh, Politkovskaya personally, and uh, uh, Alex Goldfarb, the man that I mentioned, who was a friend of uh, Litvinenko, they both cautioned Politkovskaya the last time she visited London, shortly before her murder, that she was in danger, and they advised her not to return to Russia. But she insisted that she had a mission to report on the human rights violations in her country. She was not going to give that up for her safety. And she went back and was murdered shortly thereafter. Um, Alexander Litvinenko also had forewarning of his killing. After Politkovskaya's murder, he told a British consultant for whom he was doing contract work that he would be next. According to the consultant, quote, he was worried about himself, that there might be a list or that he would be on it. In fact, Litvinenko's photo was used as a target for the firing range of Russian MVD troops. This was discovered later, that they were actually using Litvinenko. At, he was, had been labeled a traitor by the Kremlin, and therefore he was going to get his due. Um, even on the very day of Litvinenko, Litvinenko's poisoning, November 1st, 2006, he received a direct warning from an Italian associate with whom he was working to expose Russian organized crime. He was told by this associate that both uh, he and his and Berezovsky's names were on a list of those to be killed by the Russian security services. Nemtsov too, Boris Nemtsov had warnings and forewarnings that he would be killed. As far back as 2002, Ramzan Kadyrov, that's a picture of the Chechen president, who, by the way, is still president of Chechnya. Um, it's a republic that is a part of the Russian Federation. As far back as 2002, Ramzan Kadyrov, who likely participated or orchestrated some of the murders that have occurred under Putin, uh, Kadyrov threatened Boris Nemtsov after Nemtsov had spoken out at a gathering in Chechnya against the idea of a strong Chechen presidency. Kadyrov actually threatened to kill him. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Nemtsov's autobiography. I can't say that I was frightened because the Chechens who were around him started to say that Ramzan was joking. But in his eyes, I thought that it was no joke. In his eyes, I saw hatred. Not long before he was killed, Nemtsov observed in an interview that his mother was very worried that Putin would kill him. When asked if he shared her concerns, Nemtsov said, you know, yes, a little, not as much as mom, but still. According to journalist Yevgenia Albots, quote, he was afraid of being killed and he was trying to convince himself and me that they wouldn't touch him because he'd been a member of the Russian government and they wouldn't want to create a precedent. As for Skripal, Sergei Skripal, Putin himself said when Skripal was released from prison as part of this so-called spy swap, which I mentioned in 2010, Putin said publicly, quote, traitors always come to a bad end. And interestingly, more recently, when Putin has been asked about the poisoning of Sergei Skripal and his daughter, he called Skripal a scumbag and a traitor to the motherland. 
So now we get to the criminal investigations of these cases. What really happened? In the cases of Anna Politkovskaya and Boris Nemtsov, who were both killed within Russia, the investigations of their murders followed a similar pattern. And I might add that I discussed uh, discuss several other murders, uh, what I consider to be political murders of uh, politicians and journalists in Russia, and they also tend to follow these patterns. But I'm using the examples of uh, these four people in, in Russia, Politkovskaya and Nemtsov, um, because these are the people who were the most well known. Um, in both of the cases of Politkovskaya and Nemtsov, the suspects were rounded up and charged quickly. That's a picture of some of them. Uh, they put them in this uh, cage when they're going to trial. Um, but the investigators failed to uh, identify who the masterminds were. It's called the Zakazchik in Russian, the person who actually ordered the murder. This happens all the time because, as I, I've said, Putin controls the investigative organs. That would mean the, the procuracy, the prosecutor's office, the FSB, and uh, an investigative, formal investigative committee. After Politkovskaya was killed, five Chechen men were eventually arrested and found guilty. There was no motive, aside from money, <clears throat> although prosecutors claimed unconvincingly that the killers were indignant over her writings, which were critical of the Kremlin. The person who ordered the crime has never been identified. And as I said, she was shot to death in the stairwell of her apartment building when she came home from shopping. <clears throat> Oops, sorry, I'm. Um, Anna Politkovskaya's son Ilya said in 2016 that he had learned from a high level source that members of the Kremlin, Kremlin elite knew who had ordered his mother's murder but were withholding the information. In the Nemtsov case, five Chechen men were sentenced on October 2017 to 10 to 20 years for the killing. This includes a man named Zayur Dadaev, accused of actually pulling the trigger. But there was no, again, there was no apparent motive except for money. And those who organized the killing and ordered it have never been charged. In this case, the trail leads directly to Ramzan Kadyrov, the president of Chechnya, who it's, is often sort of the uh, go-between for these crimes that are committed because it's very convenient for the Russians to blame, uh, either enlist Chechens to, to actually carry out the crime or to blame Chechens because the Chechen people are very unpopular in Russia and they're considered to be kind of a lower class citizen. Um, the suspected organizer was a man named Ruslan Garameyev, and he was a relative of several high-ranking Chechen officials. He is still at large and believed to be in Chechnya. Now this happened, remember the murder happened in 2015, and it is believed that he is being protected, protected by Chechen President Kadyrov. The killers used his car to carry out the murder and lived for several months in an apartment he rented in Moscow. He was also the deputy commander of a, a regiment where the trigger man Dadaev served. Uh, this regiment, uh, this troop regiment, is now part of the Russian National Guard, which is headed by uh, a man who is a close Putin crony and also a friend and patron of Kadyrov. Then there is a man named Ruslan Mukhudinov, who is another member of this regiment. He was the one who reportedly promised money to the killers. Mr. Mukhudinov is on the Interpol list and reported to be in the United Arab Emirates. Two members of the Russian investigative team 
actually have called for both Garameyev and Muhudinov to testify, but Putin's close ally, a man named Alexander Bastrykin, who heads this committee, has refused to call them. So this just shows you how the fact that all of these investigations are controlled by Putin cronies um, makes it virtually impossible to find out who it was or, or actually to call to account and charge the people who were really responsible. Now, turning to Alexander Litvinenko, because Litvinenko was murdered on British soil, as I said, in 2006, there was a proper investigation, although it was nine years before the High Court conducted an inquiry. That was uh, in, uh, well, the inquiry started, was finished in 2016. Um, if things had gone according to the Kremlin's plan, the investigation and inquiry would never have happened. Litvinenko actually was supposed to die right after he was poisoned. And in fact, if he had died, we would never have known that he had ingested polonium-210, which is a rare radioactive substance that is only produced in Russia uh, in state, highly guarded state a highly guarded state facility. <clears throat> These are the two gentlemen who actually carried out the murder, who put the poison in Litvinenko's tea. As Sir Robert Owen, the High Court judge who conducted the British inquiry, concluded after months of hearings, uh, and by the way, these hearings were very thorough. I, ex I attended uh, some of them. Uh, there were n huge numbers of witnesses and documents, and um, they really were able to get to the bottom of what happened. And so they showed that the poison was administered to Litvinenko at the Pine Bar of the Millennium Hotel on November 1st by Alexander Lugavoy and Dmitry Koftun, who had been hired by the FSB. Uh, Lugavoy is on the right, Koftun is on the left. The two men flew back to Moscow two days after the poisoning, and the Russian government have, has refused to extradite them. I might add that when Litvinenko first became ill, they didn't know what, what it was. It took them 23 days to actually diagnose that he was, uh, and a special scientist, a, high, uh, a highly skilled person in these kinds of poisons was called in, and it was only on the day of his death that they were able to say that he died of polonium-210. So these, the Russians almost got away with this. Um, Lugovoy, who, as I said, is on the right, had actually worked for Litvinenko's mentor, Boris Berezovsky, and had been cultivating Litvinenko for several months teaming up with him, actually, to get consulting jo jobs. Litvinenko did not suspect that Lugovoy was planning to do him harm. And neither, by the way, did MI6, to whom Litvinenko was providing information. The motive of Lugovoy and Koftun, uh, the latter was enlisted in the operation um, by Lugovoy, the, the motive was probably money. But apparently, they didn't know how lethal, lethal the poison was that they brought with them to London. They inadvertently left polonium traces everywhere they went, in London and even on the airplanes and in their hotel. And um, they even contaminated themselves. I should say, this, as an aside, that just by coincidence, um, I have a place up in the Catskills, and a neighbor of mine that I didn't really know very well, um, I met two years ago, and I was telling him about my research. And he's an American businessman, and I told him about Litvinenko, and he said, oh, he said, well, I was sitting in the pine bar of the Millennium Hotel next to Litvinenko and the two killers when they put the poison in the tea. And he said, he remembered distinctly because they were speaking in Russian and they drew attention to themselves. 
And the uh, British authorities, Scotland Yard, got a hold of my neighbor and his, col his business colleagues back after they'd gone back to the States and asked them if they wanted to come over for a medical examination because they were so concerned about the, the contamination. So these men did a very sloppy job. That brings us, speaking of sloppy jobs, to the case of the poisoning of Sergei Skripal and his daughter. As with the Litvinenko case, there was special poison produced in a Russian laboratory. The poison is called Novichok. It's a nerve agent, very lethal. The Russians carried out the attack, actually now they're saying with a third Russian. Um, Two, Russian car car two Russians carried out the attack. That's a picture of the two of them. Now, their names have changed because, as it turns out, they were actually under fake passports. And thanks to some very good research by an enterprising uh, British organization, they found out who they actually are. And they are employees of the GRU, military intelligence, which is where Mr. Skripal worked. Um, <clears throat> both of them, incidentally, according to this report by this research firm called Bellingcat, both of these gentlemen, these are, these are where they're seen on cameras um, getting into the tube, I think, in London. They were captured on, on all these security cameras, so they were able to trace these men. So again, I mean, they were quite careless. Um, and in fact, uh, it's been reported that both of them previously have received uh, Kremlin awards for performing good tasks for the GRU in the past. So this is pretty much, seeing these two men is pretty much a smoking gun. It actually links the crime directly to Putin because the GRU would not orchestrate this poisoning without Putin's appro approval. Um, and that could, the same, of course, can be said actually in the other cases. Um, so we have what is a smoking gun, and we also had it in the Litvinenko case. In fact, Sir Robert Owen said that he was sure that Lugavoy and Koftun had poisoned Litvinenko. But in his final report, he was equivocal about Putin, saying only that the head of the FSB, a man named Nikolai Patrushev, and Vladimir Putin had probably approved the killing. But these men would not have acted, these two killers would not have acted on their own initiative. And no one in the FSB would have ordered them to kill Litvinenko without Putin's approval. And the same can be said of the Skripal case. Most Russia experts will tell you that these kind of things, uh, this is pretty much ha the way these things happen. And, and Mr. Putin pretty much calls all the shots. Just as Politkovskaya, Litvinenko, Nemtsov, and Skripal knew that they were in danger of being killed, they also knew that the threat came from Vladimir Putin. And they understood the way things work in the Kremlin. So, can we, we can finally, I think, dismiss such talk, which some people say, as maybe someone did it to please Putin without him knowing beforehand. Or even worse, to follow the Kremlin line, the murder could not have been ordered by Putin because it was harmful to his stature as a leader. Putin, I think, is pleased to have people suspect that he's ordered these murders because they serve as warnings to other critics and intimidate them. Now, the murders have not intimidated everyone. Uh, there's a very courageous associate of Boris Nemtsov named Vladimir Karamurza. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. He's been on quite a bit um, interviewed here in the United States. He lives in Washington and also in Moscow. He's been very outspoken in his opposition to Mr. Putin, and he has been poisoned twice, put into comas, uh, into a coma, and nearly died. And he still goes back and forth to Moscow and is still very critical. So there are people, and then I might also mention uh, the well-known 
uh, Democratic oppositionist Alexei Navalny, who just was released from prison after serving two 30-day sentences for organizing protests illegally. Navalny, uh, you've probably heard of him. He's become, he's very well known now in, Ru now in Russia. And he is pretty, he and his uh, groups of supporters have organized a lot of uh, uh, protests that are very threatening to the Kremlin. I worry about um, Alexei Navalny. He's very brave and we can only hope that the Kremlin doesn't dare do something to him. <clears throat> I should also add that in the case of Litvinenko and Skripal, the attacks have damaged Putin's global image as a wor world leader and are causing diplomatic problems. But back at home in Russia, where many people actually accepted that the Kremlin had ordered Litvinenko's murder, they are sympathetic with, with Putin. Um, Litvinenko, as I said, was viewed as a traitor who deserved to be punished. Um, and the view of many people was that the two uh, men who poisoned him, Lugovoy and Koftun, were heroes. In fact, Lugovoy was elected to the Duma and received an honor from Putin. He's also become a very wealthy man. Uh, the Duma is the parliament, by the way. Um, there is little doubt now that Western government leaders know full well that Putin, often using Vladim, uh, uh, Ramzan Kadyrov within Russia, kills his critics both at home and abroad. But they do not always have a united response. In contrast to British leaders who have not hesitated, who first of all initiated this long inquiry into the Litvinenko murder and have not hesitated to blame the Kremlin for the Skripal poisoning, President Trump pretty much ignores the evidence. At one point when asked, he said of Mr. Putin, nobody has proven that he's killed anyone He's always denied it. Trump seems to find in President Putin a kindred spirit. He admires Putin for his toughness as a leader and for his apparent firm grip on power. Also, of course, as some people have speculated, he might be defending uh, Putin because the Kremlin has compromat or compromising materials on him that would be very damaging. Um, but Trump, or, or at least the Trump administration, needs to realize that Putin is no friend to the West. And it's hugely important that Western governments call Putin to account, not only for murders abroad, like those of Litvinenko and Skripal, but also for the murders in their own country. Diplomatic and economic sanctions are, in fact, valuable tools as a response for these acts. Even though the average Russian is unlikely to stop supporting Putin when they find out about these murders, and also, of course, sometimes they are, they are sympathetic with the actions of Mr. Putin, um, the sanctions do have serious consequences for the Russian economy that ultimately have a negative effect on the Russian standard of living. And we've started to see this. Russians support their government with their pocketbooks in mind. And I might add that the recent pension reform has really damaged uh, Mr. Putin's popularity. Mr. Putin recently signed into law an extremely unpopular bill that will gradually increase the state retirement age to, for, to 60 for women and 65 for men. Most ordinary Russians are deeply opposed to this, and this has sparked really rare widespread protests across the country. In fact, a new survey, fo survey found that trust in Putin, which is now currently at 39%, had fallen nine percentage points since June and a total of 20 percentage points since last November. And this is pretty significant. 
So it, it just shows that even though Russians tend to um, admire their leaders, they have a sort of an inbuilt um, impulse to not question a strong leader. But nonetheless, this, uh, this will only go so far. And when it starts to have a negative impact on them, they begin to reconsider uh, their loyalty towards their leader. So I would say only this, that first of all, as I've said, I think that responding with economic sanctions is one of the best things that Western governments can do. And I might also add that some of the oligarchs around Putin have been seriously uh, damaged eco financially by these sanctions. And also, it makes it difficult for them to travel. They like to, the, the oligarchs are all westernizers. Their kids go to fancy British uh, preparatory schools and places in the East Coast like Yale. And uh, of course, this doesn't make them happy when Mr. Putin decides to lash out against a traitor and create this huge diplomatic furor. So I would only say that, um, you know, perhaps there, there are signs that support from within Mr. Putin's elite uh, also might be eroding because of this. Uh, Putin has now been the leader of Russia, either as prime minister or president, for over 18 years. It is possible, given recent developments, that his rule and the violence that he has committed against his own people will come to, to an end sooner than he expects. But of course, no one can make any predictions. That's it. Are there any questions? But you have to remember, it used to be 50, it, it now is 55. And so when you're suddenly told that you've gotten five years taken off and you plan, it, it, believe me, it's a really unpopular thing to do. But the Russians didn't have any choice um, because they have such a, lo a small pool of younger people who can step in. They need, they need people to work. Sorry, excuse me, you had another question? Oh, yes. No. Um, so the, the last time I was in Russia was in 2015, but I kind of snuck in across the northern border. I was doing a trip along the Arctic Sea, and I went to Murmansk and Arkhangelsk with a, with a group. And um, I, I, I don't think people in Moscow even knew I was there. The last time I was in Moscow was in 2008. And it's interesting, I was doing um, interviews. Actually, I mentioned uh, Boris Nemtsov, who'd written these very courageous reports about Putin. And I was doing a, a long article for the New York Review of Books. And so I went to Moscow with a Russian friend of mine. And uh, I did quite a few interviews, including with people who knew about the FSB and so on and so forth. So I was staying at a Marriott on Tverskaya uh, Street. And of course, the, the man, uh, the sort of the maitre d' or whatever you call him, the man behind the desk was calling cars for me and so forth. He knew what I was doing. And you know, they were notoriously snoopy. Anyway, uh, to make a long story short, the last day that I was there, I had lunch with a, a, a woman who was doing research for me, and I became violently ill, <clears throat> really, really ill. And I didn't go to hospital, but I was pretty much, uh, I had violent food poisoning. I never thought about it, uh, and it took me um, a couple of weeks, actually. I, I went home, I was living at the time in Switzerland, <clears throat> 
Um, I went back to Switzerland, but I had to go to the doctor, and you know, it, it didn't get better for quite a while. And I, now when I look back on it, it makes me wonder whether, I mean, it was kind of a coincidence because the Marriott Hotel in 2008 was a pretty clean place, and they had tons and tons of tourists. And um, anyway, I'll never know, but I won't go back until Mr. Putin steps down. In, uh, in your book, you uh, give a long history of political uh, murders uh, back to the Tsar days and to, uh, all the way to uh, Putin uh, through the Stalin years. But what distressed me the most was uh, your uh, comments or insinuations, and appropriately so, of the West's tolerance of this and never truly acting or sanctioned or anything like this or even exposing it. Uh, and there's probably many, many more that the, uh, the CIA and other uh, MI5 and 8 and however many numbers they have over there uh, that know about. Uh, why do you think that's so? Well, you know, it's very interesting that it took the British, and I was sort of just now seeing <coughs> <coughs> singing the praises of the British and Theresa, uh, Theresa May as the Prime Minister um, the, uh, in comparison to Mr. Trump and how he reacts. Um, but I, I have to say that um, after Litvinenko was poisoned in 2006, it did take the British um, a number of years before they conducted an inquiry and it was only because of the dogged efforts of Marina Litvinenko, Litvinenko's wife, who I dedicate my book to. She's become a friend of mine. Um, it was only because she never gave up and she pushed and pushed and pushed and they finally, the reason that they were hesitant and Theresa May actually was at the time Home Secretary. Um, so she's been the, she was the one who kind of didn't want to do this was for diplomatic reasons. Uh, you know, it's kind of, well, okay, so they've done this. Now, now what do we do about it? Uh, I think, and we're seeing this um, now with the, the Saudi Arabian case, that there are always these overriding <coughs> diplomatic, economic, and financial concerns. And I, I'm not justifying it by any means, but I'm just saying that this seems to be, if, if there's hesitancy on the part of Western governments, this seems to be the reason why. Uh, maybe perhaps it's a feeling, uh, and I think the Russians have kind of shown this so far, that you can basically back them into a corner and show them photographs of, like, recently these two men who, who put poison on the door of Sergei Skripal, and, and the Kremlin will just deny it. So, um, I, I, you know, the, those are pretty much the reasons, but I, I would say that that the more that Western governments acknowledge that these things happen, particularly in the lower profile cases of, of journalists and politicians in Russia, it, it, it gives heart to these people and it makes them feel recognized. So if something happens to one of their colleagues, they want the West to protest. Otherwise, they think nobody cares. Um, you used the word sloppy describing these killing agents, uh, especially with uh, Skripal and so on. Now, just in the last couple of weeks, Netherlands caught four Russians just like uh, the Skripal people, and they were looking at the hacking at the testing agency, <coughs> and Netherlands just expelled them. Netherlands didn't uh, arrest them they just expelled them and let them leave the country. So in talking about Western countries' commitment to confront um, the Russians when they're acting outside of their uh, uh, jurisdiction in foreign countries, are countries like Netherlands going to consider themselves too weak to get into a head-to-head -head confrontation with Russia? Or are we just left with uh, Germany, France, and Britain? and potentially the United States to confront Russia. Who else is going to confront Russia? That's a very good question. I think Netherlands, the Netherlands is too weak. I think they couldn't do anything unless they had the support of their Western colleagues. 
and I, I think that they probably, uh, I mean, they probably figured that rather than to keep these men and go through all of this trauma that the publicity and so forth is, is enough. Um, I'm assuming that was the decision. Now, it's interesting, here in the United States, we've seen the indictment of numbers of Russians, GRU agents, with their names and their addresses. But, of course, they're not going to come over here and we don't have an extradition treaty with Russia. And so, you know, one wonders, what's the point? Well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go into the hornet's nest of the Mueller investigation, but I think in this case that probably, it, first of all, it does show that we know what the GRU was up to, and it's pretty impressive that they got all this detail. I, I half wonder whether they didn't get a little help from some people inside the Russian security services. But um, I, I also wonder whether part of this is, is that the Mueller investigation is preparing indictments of the American co-conspirators that they do mention in, in the indictments. And if you look at the trial that's going on now against this uh, troll farm, the Internet Research Agency, there's frequent mention of unnamed co-conspirators, so I guess we have to wait and see what happens. The, the people that were killed in Boston, the Boston Marathon, were those che Chechens? Are Chechens Muslims? Yes, mm -hmm. yes they are. Um, the, the people who were killed in the Boston Marathon bombings were, were not, it, it, the two brothers, Actually, their father came from Chechnya. And in my book, um, and this is, a, this is controversial, um, it's interesting, it's, in some ways it's, it's gotten the least attention of what I, I say, but uh, in my book I have a chapter about the bombings and I became interested in it because um, the Russian government has for a long time well, ever since 9-11, you know, they've been trying to tell the U.S. government, well, we're friends because we share this common enemy, the terrorists. Well, the Kremlin is very cynical about its use of terrorism because even in its own country, it has actually used, incited radicals to commit terrorist acts which suit them, uh, which suits the Kremlin's political purposes. So I... Uh, uh, I was very uh, curious about the fact that the older brother of the two Boston bombers, Tamerlane Tsarnaev, the one who was actually killed when they were in pursuit, um, he and he was the he was the the mastermind of the, of the of the bombing. He uh, had been on the radar list of the FSB for a long time, and they actually alerted the FBI. Well, they didn't. They kind of alerted the FBI. They asked the FBI sort of as a fishing expedition about this Tamerlane Tsarnaev, who was living in Boston. His family was from uh, the North Caucasus. And he was attending, uh, 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 he was attending uh, religious services, Islamic services, and so forth. Anyway, the FBI checked Tamerlane Tsarnaev out and said, he seems to be fine. He doesn't seem to be a terrorist. <clears throat> and that was that. But the FSB, then Tamerlane, just months before he actually carried out the bombings, he went to Russia. And he spent six months there in the North Caucasus with radical groups. The FSB, of course, knew that he was there. He never could have gotten through the airport. And they must have been following his every move. He came back, there's no doubt that he came back increasingly radicalized and really bound and determined to, to carry out some sort of terrorist act. And the, the FSB never reported this to uh, the FBI or the CIA. So I, I speculate that, you know, perhaps they knew what he was up to and, and even might have encouraged it because, of course, this was... This bombing was good for the Russians. They were just about to hold the Olympics. They were being criticized for not being able to contain their own terrorism problem. Uh, 
And, you know, this kind of took the, uh, it, it, it put the focus on, on the Americans. So that remains to be, that case remains to be investigated. I want to have you all thank her for coming. Please, please join us in the...